Hi, friends. Uh, today's discussion is uh, brought to you by two professionals, two women. Uh, attorney Marina Chapelsky. I'm a matrimonial attorney in New York and New Jersey. And my great friend, Dr. Margot Rappaport, who is Hi. a Hello, wonderful everyone. <laughs> therapist <laughs> and expert in children's custody issues for courts, for divorce courts. We decided to do the show to answer many of the questions that you guys ask both myself and Margot in the course of our practices, right? And uh, we're not going to talk about everything at once. We're just going to do one topic at a time. And today's issue and topic we wanted to discuss was specifically custody. And the most common question that we get is, can the mother lose custody of her kids, basically, right? Because I feel like that's, in my practice, that is usually the most frequent question that mothers ask me. Because the fathers or the ex-husbands often threaten, uh, the, threaten the mom by saying, look, if we go to divorce, I'm going to take the kids away from you. You're a stay-at-home mom. I'm the breadwinner. The court is going to give me the kids, says the father. So before we get into it, Margo, tell us a little bit about your background, how you became an expert. All right. So those that don't know me, uh, my name is again Margo Rappaport. I'm a doctor of psychology. I have a private practice uh, here in New Jersey, New York, Florida, and uh, Oregon. And uh, my expertise in child custody uh, issues is from my times working for the state of New Jersey, for the Child Protective Services. I was an investigator for 12 years, and now I see a lot of people, a lot of women that come to me. Uh, first, sometimes couples come together to reconcile their uh, marital issues, and if it doesn't happen, I help them uh, to uh, settle and uh, mitigate their issues. However, the question number one, as Marina said, can I lose custody because my husband is threatening? That's the most common question that I uh, receive from my clients. So we have, of course, uh, you, Marina, you also work uh, in court daily. This is your job. This is your bread. I, I don't go to court as often. I do, however, uh, a lot of um, child custody assessment or marital assessment just to see who, which parent will be uh, better suited for, for the child. So that's where my expertise come from. But I, I understand also uh, that you work with women who are victims of domestic violence. Yes, and, yes. And uh, you have a group coming up that I wanted you to mention as well before we get into the discussion. Uh, you have a group coming up for women who are suffering in domestic violence situations. Can you tell more about that? It's not only that. Uh, it's not only for women and domestic violence. It's uh, for all women who are not, who are unhappy in their marriages. Uh, unfortunately, statistic is very sad saying that uh, most of the unhappy women uh, and their unhappiness is stemming from domestic violence situation. And it doesn't have to be uh, physical, physical abuse, ladies. Mm -hmm. You have to remember emotional abuse, financial abuse, uh, is also considered to be domestic violence. Threatening women to take their children away, it's also part of domestic violence issue. I agree. Therefore, we, uh, we work a lot with those. So in our group, it will be more support group for women in this similar situation that two experts, myself and uh, my colleague, one of my clinicians that work with me at the practice, we both will be helping women to find the strength and to... Um, look into the possible, you know, stronger and better future for themselves and their children and their husbands as well, because if the family can negotiate and can uh, find the better uh, ways of communication, it's so much better for everybody. I agree. I agree. Uh, mediation is also something that you do, right? So you, you're yes. both a mediator for people who want to settle their divorce peacefully and out of court and just submit a, a contract to court. And you act as an expert um, for child custody, and you have a background working for Children's Protective Services in New Jersey, which which is called DICES. Uh, well, it's called now DCPNP. It used to be oh, DICES, now it's DCPNP. 
Department of Child Protection and Permanency. Right. So they they uh, so tell us tell like maybe there's a it's people always like to hear a story about a situation that maybe is similar to their situation, right? So since we started talking about when can a mother lose physical primary or residential custody, it depends how you call it, of a child. When does that happen in the real world? So you have seen it happen. When does the mother lose custody of the kids? Right. Uh, it's a very sad question that we have to ask, right? As an attorney, you can, you can share that. It's very, uh, very unusual uh, that that happens because, and you mentioned before, most of the time in your experience, uh, fathers choose to kind of take a step back and let the mother or let the child uh, continue living with mom. And they have, uh, you know, visitation time where they have like 50-50 share legal custody. And the, the mother usually has residential custody. So it's very unique and unusual. Those are very important words you said. Very unique and very unusual for the mother to completely lose custody of the child unless she wants to, which you know, I have seen happen to some mom who can't handle it. But right. in other words, it's an empty threat by a father, right? It is most of the time in my uh, in my experience, and uh, just to add to my experience, I came here from Latvia, and uh, where I used to work as a, a psycho psychologist at the Department of uh, Children and Families at the local police precinct. So um, I used to work with uh, children from you know different backgrounds as well as. Uh, children who were victims of domestic violence situations. So to add there, uh, in Russia or former USSR, uh, Eastern Europe, there's a lot more um, cases where the father gets custody. Okay. However, those, they have to do with mostly uh, monetary uh, abilities of the fathers rather than their ability to parent here in us i have not seen that many situations in my uh what so 23 years in practicing in us i've had only two cases where uh the mother lost uh, their her custody of the children it had to do in one instance with drugs yeah she was uh it was not just accused of doing drugs it was proven over and over again, but by the Child Protective Services and her husband uh, and the family. So she was actively using uh, drugs. The second situation, uh, mother lost custody because of um, very, un <laughs> I cannot even find the word uh, to describe the father, her ex-husband's uh, behavior. So he did lie to courts. He did aggressive lie and lying. Aggressively yes. lying to court. Aggressively lying. Uh, I'm sure I can't. I have no proof, but you know I can only assume based on uh, the circumstances that he was paying uh, his expert witnesses, uh, his lawyers, who uh, did everything uh, possible and impossible to uh, discredit uh, the wife in front of the court system. And unfortunately, as we all know, even though we do believe that the justice will prevail, sometimes situation does not happen like this, and um, you know, the judge makes the decision based on the hard evidence, uh, which can be, you know, uh, not very uh, evidential. Uh, so from my experience, I have seen uh, twice uh, the mother completely lose custody of the kids. In one situation, just like you said, the mother was an active drug user and her new partner, he was also a drug user. So it didn't happen overnight. At first, when we filed a violation of custody agreement and, you know, a petition for custody change where my client was the father, the sober father, uh, at first it took us many, many trips to court, her violating the agreements she had with ACS and us and the court about treating, going to the, you know, counseling program doing all the stuff she missed that those court dates she got arrested with a kid in the middle of like a really dangerous area in the bronx in the middle of nowhere it, like you know she the kid constantly 
testified and both to ACS and to us and to the court attorney who interviewed also they appointed a law guardian for the child so not only was ACS going to see him but there was a per, a separate attorney for the child appointed as often happens in these contested custody cases so again the child told the custody the law guardian that there's you know constant drug use and alcohol use in front of him and he was a little kid he was like seven i think mm -hmm. and uh it took many, many times. And finally, when the mother was arrested, they did a temporary custody change to the father. And then they kept trying to give the child back to the mother, but the mother kept violating the agreement about going to treatment and going to counseling. Right. And it took her violating many, many, many times, not like once or twice or three times, and many court dates to finally say, okay, we're going to make this a permanent situation with the custody to the father, with some visitation to the mother, and so on. So it was a huge fight. And finally, it ended with a settlement. She had an attorney appointed to her by the court. And finally, we settled it with the custody being changed to the father. Because initially, he didn't want custody. When she was okay, he was fine just visiting every other weekend, right? So that was one situation. In another situation, the father definitely prepared everything ahead of time to get the mother to lose custody, including getting her arrested falsely, including like the nanny was in on it. It, it was like a huge conspiracy. And I really believed the mother because she was a professional person. Uh, she, she, I, I, I believe she was like a doctor or something like that, that they had twins together and she wasn't the kind of person who was like a druggie or attacking him or anybody out of the blue. But he set everything up so that she kept getting arrested for violating. She got arrested once on a false charge. He got an order of protection from criminal court. Then he kept reporting her for violating, which she wasn't. So she got arrested over and over again. So there was a lot going on. And it took years and years for her just to get regular visitation, like you said. But... Those, you know, that's something you can never really prepare for. You don't know what your spouse sometimes is planning, you know, if they're really Absolutely. bad, you know, if they're really, um, what's the word for it? You know, they're really like aggressive and underhanded and a liar and willing of to, course. But to you, use you, the you, system. You can agree that uh, it's not, it's not very common, right? So most of the women that come to me, uh, they say, listen, I haven't been working. I'm staying at home mom. I raised my, my children. I cook for my husband. I clean. I do everything. I don't have any help. I don't have any friends. What I'm going to do, the, the, he's going to take my children away. So for situations like this, what would you say? What would you say to a mother who is, uh, you know, crying and uh, she's, uh, she's living for those children? That's, that's all her life. That's all she knows. What would your response be to her? I would say that it's very unique and unusual for you to lose custody of the kids unless you use drugs or alcohol or have history of like some serious mental illness with danger to yourself and others, not just like mental illness even. But definitely the fact that the, you know, if you leave uh, a situation where you're unhappy with your children and you let the father know it's not like a kidnapping you let him know i'm leaving and the kids are coming with me and that happens the father has to pay child support to support the kids so you're not going to be completely without any money or on the street uh also you have to do what's in the best interest of the children you know feed them you know dress them appropriately for the weather go to school every day and things like that it doesn't have to be anything unusual that you have to do to keep custody of your kids just being like a regular mom is enough you know correct like, correct we we'll, we also use uh when i used to work for dcpnp we used uh a term uh basic needs must be met so what are basic needs are you you're correct one or two outfits weather appropriate and size appropriate obviously then we have to have provide the two hot uh, meals a day uh, for the child. They have to have roof over their head and the car cannot be that roof over their head. Their medical uh, school and psychological needs must be met. But again, 
And the father says, you have no job. You have no money. I'm going to take the kids away. Uh, I would like our you know listeners to know that of every state, both New Jersey and New York, they have a lot of resources. Both uh, Marina's office and my office, we, we have those resources available to share with you. At any point of time, you should not be living in a domestic violence situation uh, because there are ways to uh, protect yourself and the children. And we can always be uh, happy to consult uh, any uh, woman in need. Uh, we can, you know, you guys can call us, you can email us, and uh, we can schedule appointments with you uh, to help you to uh, stop the cycle of violence. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, if you have immigration problems, which in our community, that also often goes hand in hand. You know, domestic violence and immigration problems. Sometimes the father is the U.S. citizen. The mom is still undocumented. And by the way, that's part of domestic violence. When the father refuses to legalize the mother, like she has his children and she's in America for 11 years, there's no reason why he didn't get her green card yet. But that happens. And I see that. Uh, that's also part of a reason you should leave and not be afraid and file for something called VAWA, for a green card for yourself because that happens and it is abuse when your u.s citizen spouse is refusing to get you legalized in other words you could just get arrested by immigration any day if he doesn't legalize you so right. that, that you know prevent it and it's not that hard you know and it doesn't cost that much money to file for a green card for someone but absolutely uh, and yeah. also living living uh, i'll add that living uh with a constant threat by uh a spouse that they will uh, prosecute you or will deport you or will take your children away. It is a part of domestic violence because it's an emotional abuse. It's not as easy to prove as physical because after physical, you have some markings on your body that you know you can easily say that that was my husband's doing, but the emotional abuse uh, is still an abuse and uh, amazing uh, attorneys like Marina and her team, uh, they can uh, provide you with, uh, you know, with support in, uh, and get, help you get out of those situations as well. Right, and um, the courts in both New York and New Jersey look at what's considered best interest of the child for the child's safety and custody determinations. In New Jersey, there's something called the Bill of Rights for the children. And these are the rights of children to be safe and what Margaret just said, having two hot meals a day, having appropriate clothing, appropriate for the weather and the size of the child, going to get their medical needs, uh, you know, met. And by the way, uh, it's definitely a violation on the parent who is allowing themselves to be abused and the kids abused. When you keep allowing the abuse to happen, that's called a violation. Um, it's it's uh, actually of the Family Court Act in New York. So that's considered you being uh, guilty of parental neglect. Correct. You allowing yourself to be abused in front of the kids and allowing the kids to be abused by the father or whoever it is in the family is equal to you being parentally neglecting your child. So don't think it's like you're just putting up with it for yourself. You're actually violating the law. You're breaking the law and could have criminal repercussions from this by remaining in an abusive situation. Not only common sense says you should leave, you shouldn't let yourself get, you know, beat up or, or you know, abused in front of the kids, but also the law says you shouldn't do that. And, no. and uh, I had a situation where the mother told us that um, they had kids with them in the car and they went somewhere for a party and the parents had a drink, both of them. And then they got in the car and there was a fight over a parking spot, right? So the police came and somehow everyone got arrested, right? So she got arrested, not for assault or anything like that. She got arrested for parental neglect because the kids were in the back of the car when the parents were trying to drunk drive and then, you know, have a fight with other people over a parking situation. So not only was the father who was arrested and charged with assault and all this other stuff and, you know, breaking the peace and all that stuff. But she was charged in family court with parental neglect. 
she had to deal with ACS and all that stuff. At the end, it got dismissed and the case was closed. But things like that happen. So when you're in a situation like that, remember, it's not just you that you're worried about. You have to think about the kids and how the law would treat you in regard to how you're treating the kids in that situation. You know, so so if you don't want to think about yourself and saving yourself, at least understand you're putting the kids in jeopardy when they have to see you being abused. And I tell people like this, look, you're raising either potential abusers Abusing. or potential victims. Your kids, by seeing this, and I'm not a psychologist, but I know it from just watching and, and seeing what's happening, you know, um, either your kids who grow up with watching mom, let's say, get beaten up all the time or called names, whatever, either the boy or the girl could grow up and be an abuser themselves, or they're going to be abused. They're going to subconsciously, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, seek out those relationships. Right. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm not going to correct you. Uh, there is definitely truth to it. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, you are correct. When uh, we're looking at the statistic and statistic has shown that children um, abuse children, especially sexually uh, and emotionally abuse children, they become abusers themselves. And uh, it is uh, absolutely truth. And I see it in my daily work with my patients that uh, a woman who has been uh, a child of divorce, a child that witnessed domestic violence between the parents, she will be seeking similar relationship because it's what she knows and that's what normalized to her. Even though the father has never hit her, let's say uh, physically, or has never done anything to her directly, but was abusing um, physically and emotionally uh, her mom. So she will be seeking for the similar um, characteristics in yes. her future husbands. Yeah. Yeah. So if we just take anything out of this, you know, custody determinations have a lot of components to them, right? There's a lot of parts to this. Of course. But of course, when the expert gets called, when does that happen? When people can't agree, right? right. Tell, tell, you know, when the parents cannot agree on the custody arrangement, the court needs help from an expert. Because the court cannot make those kinds of decisions themselves. The judge is not a psychologist. They don't know how children's mental health works. So they get somebody like Dr. Rappaport involved and say, look, can you talk to these people? Can you review the records? Can you tell the court? What do you recommend? And so what kinds of questions would you ask both parents if you, you know, if you're doing that kind of a report, that kind of an evaluation? It's a very, I have to say that it's a very extensive evaluation where not only the parents and the child and the, the records are involved. Uh, when I uh, did those evaluations, I would go to school. I would go to uh, friends and family. Uh, oftentimes I would talk to uh, co-workers uh, of, the, of both parents to collect enough information because, um, you know, in hour or two hours that I'm spending asking specific questions of the parents, I don't believe that all the answers are 100% true. But when you collect information and, you know, character witnessing from uh, friends and family, you get a better picture. And um, I've also seen a, a lot, and I, I'm not afraid of word a lot, but a lot of manipulation from, you know, both parents. Because, of course, who wants to lose custody? Who wants to be told that, no, you're not a good parent to your children. Maybe you're not, but you don't want to hear about that. So yeah. um, the questions that I ask, uh, I usually ask about uh, the child. Describe your child. You know, what do they like? What they don't like? Things that um, you like to do with them. What's their favorite food? That helps me to identify a, a parent who is involved with a child. For example, uh, moms, most of us. Um, I'm not always, honestly, because my kids have all five, they have different tastes and they are constantly changing. So you cannot keep up with that. But if you are involved with the child on a regular basis, you need to know uh, basic stuff. You know, the, the school, uh, the friends, uh, the likes and dislikes. So all those questions I do ask. And then I ask about the conflict. How do they, uh, you know, take care of the conflict in a family? How do they discipline? Because that also gives me a lot of information about uh 
ability to parent the child the way it is expected by our uh, society. Because at the end of the day, we have social rules for a reason. We have uh, laws and policy for a reason. And we have uh, expected behavior from both parents because as parents, we the ones to, ra uh, to raise the children to become adults, to become mm -hmm. a part of this uh, community and society. And depends on how, what belief system, what, uh, you know, thought process we install in the child, how they're going to treat others in a society. So I always keep, you know. And, and I want to clarify, it doesn't mean that, let's say if mom is uh, Catholic and father is Muslim, that there's anything wrong with that, having different doesn't values. Matter. The point is matter. that you're a good parent and you know right. what's going on with your child. And right. sometimes co-workers, neighbors, friends will give a more clear picture, right, of the other parent, maybe. Correct. Or, and it doesn't you know, mean they will all be, always will be right because, you know, maybe your neighbors don't like you. And uh, if they don't <laughs> like you, they can manipulate. But that's why we are the experts. We're not blindly following and we're not blindly believing every single word people are saying. We don't do that. We also observe the behaviors. We observe the child and their natural environment. Uh, and we speak with children as well. And uh, as a part of my training, uh, I have been trained in uh, investigating and interviewing children for uh, sexual abuse or you know abuse or neglect in general. And final question before we wrap up. Who pays for the custody expert? All right. Uh, parents do. Okay, parents so do. if you are going to drag the other spouse through the process of having an expert, and it usually goes by income. So if, let's say, one parent is the breadwinner and demands this custody determination, they have to be prepared to pay for the expert's time and it's probably hourly, right? And then there's probably a separate right. fee for a report and all right. that. So it right. doesn't and just that, happen I'll by tell itself. You, it's a hefty sum. It's a hefty sum. It's it's a very hefty amount that uh, needs to be paid. There are uh, I don't know any uh, child custody expert who will be uh, working pro bono. Um, maybe once in a blue moon we do, but uh, for the most part, uh, the fee begins about ten thousand dollars per evaluation. Usually more. Yeah, so it's expensive. And so that means that you should try everything in your power to settle your divorce and custody parenting arrangement and situation and plan peacefully. Otherwise, Absolutely. it might not turn out the way you think. It's going to be expensive. But at the end of the day, if, if it's necessary, it's, it's definitely necessary. And it's a case-by-case -case basis. So if you have any questions, if you want counseling, if you need, um, you know, anything, any support, Margot's office in New Jersey has a, a big team of clinicians, of uh, psychotherapists for any need for adults, for kids, for weight loss. I know they, they have a great program <laughs> for weight loss, for marriage counseling, and for mediation. Margot does mediation. And uh, we can represent you in your divorce. So we're going to do more because this is just touching the tip of the iceberg. I'd like to discuss next time disparaging parents in divorce, right? That means when, when mom gets the kids and she says bad things about dad, when dad has the kids, he says bad things about mom. How do courts look at that? What's a good you know, course of, of, of conduct on that? And so many more things we want to talk about with Dr. Margo. So, uh, Dr. Marco, do you want to leave any your closing statement? As we say, well, would you like to add anything before we wrap up? There is so much. There's so many things that we can talk about, and uh, I am. Um, I since I'm a professor of psychology, I do teach. I love public speaking. There is a lot more that we can offer you as our listeners uh, and uh, direct patients, direct clients. Uh, please be kind to each other. Be kind to your children because at the end of the day, your children will be treating you the way you deserve. It's true. Everyone have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.